On February 24th, Russian forces suddenly invaded Ukraine, with ground troops attacking eastern Ukraine while Russia launched missile attacks on several cities, including Kyiv, Ukraine's capital. It was the largest offensive in Europe since the end of World War II. The move has stunned the world. Russian President Vladimir Putin called the operation a special military operation. In the two days that followed, foreign journalists at the Chinese Foreign Ministry's press conference took turns asking, Does China consider Russia's actions an invasion? Will China condemn it? In response, a Chinese spokesman played word games, refusing to call Russia's actions an invasion. Those ambiguous expressions reflect Beijing's dilemma. At the same time, we have also seen that the Ukrainian issue has its complex and special historical background. China understands Russia's legitimate concerns on security issues. China advocates that the Cold War mentality should be completely abandoned and a balanced, effective and sustainable European security mechanism should be formed through dialogue and negotiation. Some countries, such as the US and Europe, have announced sanctions against Russia. For instance, US President Joe Biden announced more sanctions targeting Russian banks, oligarchs and the high-tech sector. We always oppose all illegal unilateral sanctions. We urge relevant parties to handle issues related to Ukraine and European relationship in a way that won't hurt benefits of China and other countries. Wang also hit back against US President Joe Biden's comment that any country that backed Russia's invasion would be stained by association. The countries whose reputations that are truly stained are those that arbitrarily interfere in other nations' internal affairs and launch foreign wars everywhere in the name of democracy and human rights. What makes the CCP uncomfortable is that Putin has tied the CCP to this war that challenges the entire Western world. In the meantime, Beijing doesn't have the ability to influence Russia. The official Chinese media has explained to the Chinese people that Russia's actions are understandable because NATO hasn't held up to its agreement not to expand eastward. However, it doesn't justify Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Invading another country's territory is a blatant violation of international conventions, which makes it difficult for Beijing to support it publicly and on a global stage. Let's review a little bit of history to get an idea of how the current scenario came to be. To counter Soviet expansion into Europe after World War II, NATO, a military alliance of 12 countries including the US, Canada, the UK and France, was formed in 1949. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. Since then, NATO has expanded into Eastern and Central European countries such as Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, which were either part of the Soviet Union or within its sphere of influence. Membership in the alliance obligates the U.S. to provide them with protection. Ukraine is one of the former Soviet Union republics and shares borders with both Russia and the European Union. Ukraine isn't a member of NATO, but it's a partner nation, meaning that there is a consensus within NATO that it may be allowed to join the alliance at some point in the future. Ukraine's membership in NATO is considered a red line by Russia. Putin wants to make Ukraine a part of Russia's sphere of influence, especially in the eastern part of Ukraine, the military heartland. He doesn't want Kyiv to become the front line of NATO where Russia has to face NATO troops directly. Currently, Putin's request has been that Ukraine maintains its neutral status and prevents the deployment of weapons from other countries in the region. After all, even if Russia destroys Ukraine, given the region's vast size and high hostility, it could be a nightmare for Moscow. Over the past few decades, many politicians in the West have enthusiastically embraced Red China, a regime that explicitly embraces a communist ideology. In October 1971, a UN resolution declared the expulsion of Chiang Kai-shek's representatives from the seats they illegally occupy in the UN and all its bodies. After the Tiananmen Square massacre on June 4, 1989, Western countries only made verbal condemnations and imposed insignificant sanctions. In late June of 1989, President Bush sent National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft and Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger on a secret visit to China. A year later, the U.S. unconditionally renewed China's most favored nation trade status. In November 2001, China officially joined the World Trade Organization. Relying on the U.S.-dominated world order, the CCP has grown economically and militarily to become the second largest economy in the world. These political figures in the West have made post-Cold War Russia their imaginary enemy, claiming that Russia lacks democracy and is aggressive towards neighboring countries. 
Their exclusion of Russia from the new European security order virtually crushed the Russian dream of returning to the Western camp. In the midst of such hostility, Russia, in economic distress, has gradually moved toward Beijing, opting for an alliance with the CCP, which is very generous with money. In early February, Putin went to Beijing for the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. It was a great honor for the Communist Party leader, Xi Jinping. Putin's trip to Beijing was full of success. Prior to the opening of the Winter Olympics, China and Russia reached a number of agreements to channel funds. The two sides signed a total of 15 cooperation documents, including agreements on the purchase and sale of bulk commodities such as oil, gas, and wheat exported from Russia to China. They also signed an agreement on cooperation in the temporal interoperability of the global satellite navigation systems Beidou and GLONASS between China and Russia, and an agreement on cooperation between the two sides in the field of informization and digitization. The most noteworthy of these agreements is the signing of an agreement between state-owned Russian oil company Rosneft and China National Petroleum Corporation to supply 100 million tons of petroleum to China for a period of 10 years. At the same time, the two sides signed a supplemental agreement to guarantee the supply of crude oil to refineries in western China. In addition, PetroChina signed a long-term gas supply agreement with the Russian national energy corporation, Gazprom. According to the agreement, through the Sino-Russian Far East pipeline, Russia will supply China with a total of 48 billion cubic meters of pipeline gas per year, which is about 26% higher than the current supply plan. The Russian side also said it's planning a new pipeline, which, when it eventually comes to fruition, will add another 50 billion cubic meters of gas to China annually. China's paying Russia higher prices for oil and gas compared to the international market. European gas prices rose to 115 US dollars per cubic meter by the end of 2021. According to the Chinese General Administration of Customs, the price of Russian gas supplies to China rose to 148 US dollars per cubic meter in the second quarter of 2021 from 121 in the first quarter. The 15 contracts also require the CCP to invest in new Russian projects in the north and make advance payments for Russian oil exports to China, totaling about 140 billion to 200 billion US dollars. The total value of these contracts is expected to be more than 300 billion. The day before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, i.e. February 23rd, the General Administration of Customs of China issued a circular titled, Announcement on Allowing the Import of Wheat Throughout Russia, Allowing the Import of Wheat Across the Territory of Russia. In the 1990s, China had banned the import of Russian wheat because of its contamination problems. Although China has a serious food shortage and needs to import large quantities of grain, it doesn't have to import Russian contaminated wheat. The recent agreement seems to have removed such restrictions. It is very likely that the CCP didn't anticipate that Putin would actually end up invading Ukraine when they signed the agreements. The Wall Street Journal reported that after Putin left Beijing, the top seven standing committee members of the CCP met behind closed doors for most of the Winter Olympics in Beijing from February 7th to 20th arguing and debating over the Ukraine crisis and Russian-Chinese relations. China also didn't evacuate its embassy staff and other Chinese personnel in Ukraine in advance. About 6,000 Chinese are now stranded in Ukraine after the war went into full swing. I'm an overseas Chinese currently living in Kiev, Ukraine. I'm at home now, and behind me is the Kiev TV tower. I heard the wail of an air raid siren at around 7 this morning. It was quite terrifying. As you can see, there is also very little traffic on the street behind me. I have a sufficient stock of food and water at home. Still, I was scared and nervous the moment the air raid siren blared. I hope there will be no war in any country at any time. And I hope that all this will soon be over. Now let's look back and consider, without the backing of orders that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars from the CCP, would Russia have attacked Ukraine?
A source reported in overseas Chinese media claimed that the CCP originally wanted the purchase agreements regarding gas and oil to be settled in RMB, but Putin refused and demanded settlement in euros. This is equivalent to China paying for the Russian war with its own economy. In addition, Ukraine is significant for China as a diplomatic gateway to Europe and has become a major source of energy and food since China's trade war with the US and Australia in 2018. For example, China imports more than 70% of its energy imports from the Donbass region, which is in the eastern part of Ukraine, where high-quality coal mines are found. In terms of the military aspect, Ukraine is China's most important source of alternative to Russia. What Russia didn't want to sell to China in the past, the CCP imported from Ukraine instead, including the CCP's Liaoning aircraft carrier. If Russia takes full control of the eastern part of Ukraine, it will have more power to restrain the CCP. In December 2013, Chinese President Xi Jinping and then-Ukrainian President signed the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation between China and Ukraine, under which China pledged to provide Ukraine with security guarantees in the event of a threat of aggression against the country. Now, this document is expected to be a waste of paper. As the situation in Ukraine worsens, the West is imposing more sanctions. If the CCP continues to be vague or even secretly supports Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it is likely to lead to negative consequences, including economic sanctions for Beijing. The Xi Jinping administration doesn't want to fully challenge the West, but it definitely doesn't want to undermine the Sino-Russian alliance that it has worked so hard to build. Beijing is therefore in an awkward position. It carefully avoids criticizing Russia for its invasion of Ukraine and blames the U.S. for starting the war. Yet, it is obliged to say that it respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. On February 25th, Russia vetoed the UN security action on Ukraine. China abstained. So, what benefits does the CCP gain from the Ukraine crisis? First of all, if Russia is at war with the West, the global spotlight will be on Putin, and if the international community shifts its focus, it helps alleviate the immense pressure on the CCP. Second, Beijing is closely watching and assessing how the Russian attack on Ukraine will end and whether the international community's sanctions will be effective. The CCP regime has long insisted that it will one day take over Taiwan and won't hesitate to use military means. If the CCP believes that international sanctions or related moves are ineffective, then perhaps Beijing will accelerate its plans to annex Taiwan. One of the purposes of the CCP's efforts to draw Russia in so heavily is that it wants Russia to support its attack on Taiwan as well. Russia has broken the peace and invaded Ukraine. The whole world has severely condemned this. We also condemn this sort of aggression very severely, and at the same time, we will sanction it in step with other democratic countries. Taiwan and Ukraine are very different. We are not only important in the world's industrial chain, but also in terms of geopolitics, politics, or the geographical environment. We are doing our best regarding national unity, and we deeply despise those who echo the cognitive warfare launched by foreign forces. We will absolutely protect the country's sovereignty and security, and we will certainly uphold national sovereignty and protect people's security in line with the world's democratic countries. A few days ago, on February 22nd, a Weibo user who works as a director of the CCP media outlet made a post that reads, Show me the text before the initial release. When it comes to news related to the situation in Russia and Ukraine, use topics from the national media, People's Daily, Xinhua News Agency, and CCTV to control the direction of public opinion. Any news that's unfavorable to Russia or leans toward the Western democratic position can't be published and only put out appropriate and favorable comments and block out all unfavorable comments. This Weibo post is suspected to be this director accidentally posting a directive from his superiors. Radio Free Asia later quoted mainland media sources as saying that this guidance for public opinion came from the Central Propaganda Department and that the relevant notice had been sent to official media at all levels. Recently, the situation in Ukraine has been on China's social media ranking number one on Sina Weibo's hot searches. Under the CCP's propaganda guidance, voices applauding the invasion have become the main chord, with some even calling for the restoration of the former Soviet Union's territory. There are also many posts threatening Taiwan, such as one that reads, Watch out Taiwanese, Ukraine will only demonstrate once. 
The speed of modern warfare means sending troops in the morning, reunification at noon, issuing ID cards with nucleic acid testing in the afternoon, watching CCTV in the evening, and raising the national flag and playing the national anthem early the next morning. However, the information released by China's internet doesn't necessarily represent authentic public opinion. China's social media is strictly censored. It means statements that criticize the authorities or are inconsistent with the main narrative advocated by the CCP will have been suspended or cancelled. Against this backdrop, there are still voices that risk speaking out, deviating from the CCP's main narrative. They oppose the war and the needless loss of lives. They believe Russia's invasion of Ukraine will have a major impact on the world, and they oppose the invasion. There are also messages that believe that China's real enemy is Russia in the north. One individual wrote, CCTV livestreamed the war between Russia and Ukraine, a battlefield that's far away from us. The chained woman with eight children in Fang County of Shuzhou is close to us. If your mother, wife, or daughter gets abducted, would it pain your heart? Instead of live streaming a foreign war, stream the tragic case of our own loved ones. Grow some conscience. In the run-up to the Ukraine crisis, many Western politicians pin their hopes on the CCP. The New York Times reported on February 25th, citing U.S. officials, that senior Washington officials have held emergency meetings with senior CCP officials six times in the past three months, hoping that the CCP could lobby the Russians not to send troops. But the CCP made it clear at each meeting that it didn't believe aggressive action was in the pipeline. The report explained that some U.S. officials believe that Russian-Chinese relations are stronger than at any time since the Cold War, and that it's in the interests of the CCP to convince Putin. What these officials don't realize is that Russia and the CCP have never really been friends. In fact, Putin even seems to trust India more than the CCP. The Indian Ministry of External Affairs issued a press release late on February 24th stating that Indian Prime Minister Modi had spoken to Putin by phone. In the conversation, Modi called for an end to the conflict in Ukraine and called on all sides to work together to return to diplomatic talks and dialogue. Putin briefed Modi on the latest developments in Ukraine. The Indian statement also noted that the two heads of state agreed that officials and diplomatic teams would continue to maintain regular contact on pressing issues. During the months of May and June 2020, clashes occurred along the India-China border. Russia delayed the delivery of S-400 missiles ordered by the CCP in 2014, but accelerated the delivery of five sets of S-400 missiles ordered by India in 2018. In August 2020, India's ambassador to Russia had extended an invitation to the Russian deputy foreign minister to invite Russia to join the U.S.-led initiative, an organization seen as designed to unite Indo-Pacific countries to counter the CCP. Russia's alliance with Beijing is based only on an international environment and relationship of interest in which both sides are aware of their mutual distrust for each other. There is a link to a previous episode on this topic in the description box below. One detail can be noted here. On October 31, 2017, Putin set up the unveiling of the Wall of Grief commemorating the victims of political persecution in the Soviet Union. This terrible past can't be erased from the national memory, and especially it can't be justified in any way, in the name of any supreme, so-called interests of the people. On the eve of launching a military offensive against Ukraine, Putin delivered a nearly one-hour nationally televised address on February 21st. He said, after the revolution, the main task of the Bolsheviks was to remain in power at all costs, to be precise, at any cost. The historic, strategic mistakes made by the Bolshevik leaders, the leadership of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, at different periods of state-building, economy, and state policy, have led to the disintegration of our unified state. Just imagine the embarrassment that the Red leaders in China must have felt when they heard Putin proclaiming such logic to the world. Perhaps many politicians of the West have not yet realized that the CCP is the biggest threat to the world's democracies. Now, what's likely to happen is that Russia, faced with deep international isolation and opposition, may actually turn to the CCP and become dependent on it. The CCP is probably going to be deeply involved in this crisis, and the world dynamics will become even more intricate and uncertain.